aren't your father's submarine races. In fact, it's not likely that Dad could have put together the intricate computers that are bottled up in, hopefully, watertight cases. Mark Lee is on the Cornell University team that built the Gemini. This is the first year that we're going into a dual hull design. Previous years, we've actually had our vehicle the electronics all enclosed in a single hull. But this year, we want to um, improve our uh, access to our custom electronics. So if you see in the back hall, you have all our student design and student manufactured printed circuit boards. Yes, students built and designed the circuit boards. They chose the engines, they designed the cameras and sensors that let the submarine see, and they wrote the computer code that runs everything. Melissa Hamada is one of 40 undergraduates on the Cornell team, and she worked on the power source. My project this year was working on the battery pods, and um, that's basically a lithium polymer pack. And I made a, um, I made a board that allows for the safe charging and discharging of those packs, because um, they're pretty volatile. It's a pretty important piece of the puzzle, because without power, the robotic sub won't do anything in the water. Daryl Davidson is the executive director of the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International Foundation. That's the group that put together the competition. He says the competitors bring state-of-the-art robots. When you figure out that nobody is controlling the submarine once it submerges and that it's doing all of these very difficult tasks on its own, that's when you understand how complex that really is. Because if you had a student driving the sub through this course, they would all do it pretty easily. 17 years ago, when the competition first began, it was quite different from what's going on in the Point Loma pool today. The very first year we did this, we had four teams. Uh, it was a challenge for any of those four teams to get in the water and actually move in a straight line. What we now are up to are 38 teams from all over the world that get out here. Davidson says that straight line hurdle is only a qualifier for teams to compete now. In the finals, robots are required to go through underwater gates, navigate a winding course, recognize different colored buoys, and even pick up objects. He says the technology is complex and it requires a variety of skill sets. Perhaps most importantly, Davidson says, it requires planning. But it really requires them to be very broad in their thinking and then to organize and manage their time because they're doing this while they're still students and having to do all the work required of students. And while most of the teams are from colleges around the world, high school teams can qualify. Karen Samel goes to Emory Valley High School in Northern California. His team was dealing with a difficult bit of luck. Their robot moved well enough underwater but failed to find the right colored buoys. It ended up skipping an obstacle. Well, it was a disaster in, the t in, in, in perspective that didn't work as we wanted to, but that we, if we can change a few things, it should be fine. We think it'll be good. The team had hoped for cloudy conditions during their run, but the sun was out and that hindered their robot sensors. Samel and the team were working out in a practice pool to try to fix the problem before a late afternoon run. Well, we always have different problems every single year. So, I mean, the, the challenges are all there, but now this, you just have more experiences that you can build on and know what to do when you run into a problem and whatnot. So maybe a bit easier, but we still it's still quite challenging. 